morning, everybody. Jake Shaw, Mountain View Home Inspections here in Colorado Springs, certified professional inspector. We're gonna inspect this tri-level house. Let's go. So what I do is when I get to the beginning of the house and I'm just kind of taking a look at everything, you can get a pretty good idea of how the roof is looks, uh, the condition of it, the age maybe. Driveway, obviously, everything slopes, uh, vegetation around the home, those sorts of things. Obviously, we've got some cracking and some settling here. A little bit of trip hazards, probably point that out to your clients, that there's a little bit here. This could be kind of raised up a little bit with some mud jacking, probably. I always move from, uh, just like on the interior of a home, I move from uh, left to right and just keep moving that way. That way I circle all the way around the house and then don't miss anything. If you look at things several different times from several different angles, then different things will pop out at you. But make sure you take your documentation pictures you can either put them into software or keep them for later, depending on how you, how you like to do your inspection. A little wider here, but when this home was built, they weren't really requiring you to put uh, four inches between the balusters. But of course, according to the SOP, we need to call that out. More than likely, this tree is going to be, have to be trimmed once or twice a year just to keep all the limbs and everything off of the roof. I'm going to get up on the roof. We'll take a little bit better look at that, but obviously that's, that's just ongoing vegetation maintenance. You can already kind of get a feel for how the, without even having look in the backyard, you can get a feel for how the, the, it's sloping away from the house and coming down kind of into this, this draw here, and then it'll move out that way so it's got good drainage. I've got this laid out pretty well. Come over and take a look at the master shut off. Make sure you identify that. Take a picture of it. Circle it. Put it in your report so that the homeowner knows where it is. I always come over and get my nose real close to it because you can sometimes I've found leaks. It'll leak sometimes across the uh, where the threads are. You can kind of move stuff around a little bit, see if it's leaking. This one doesn't appear to be. Turn that on. SOP doesn't require us to uh, get the water uh, pressure, but you can kind of do a visual on it, see if it's a little bit high when it runs that way. And then, we'll, of course, we'll do a, a functional test on the interior of the home. Start by kind of pulling yourself back, getting a big visual, and then move forward and getting a little bit closer to things. You can see on the back fence here, this is blown down probably that storm we had in December. Notate that they've got a um, sprinkler system here. And then recommend that they have it cleaned and, or uh, serviced, or at least I'd, I recommend that they have it serviced that way. Uh, when they have a professional come out, they can get all the heads and everything aligned and have all everything kind of set up to where it's, it's just a, an automatic thing. And then clients don't have to worry about it until the fall when they have to go or when they get it uh, blown out. Water's pretty sparse here and it's very expensive, so you don't want to be wasting it. So it's good to have clients or good to educate your clients on those sorts of things, especially if they're new homeowners and they've, they've never really had uh, sprinkler systems. They'll be very appreciative of the knowledge that you can help them with.
don't know if you would call that a handrail or not, but that's what they've got here. Probably just go ahead and call that out and recommend because there's more than, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five steps here. Recommend that they just have a handrail put up there. That way anybody coming in or out can have something sturdy to grab a hold of. Some of these will have test modes on them. This one doesn't appear to, but you can just change, uh, push these over into test mode and then the lights will turn on for you. Don't see any other didn't see any other outlets anywhere so it's just the ones here in the back it uh, tripped with the GFCI so it's covered or GFCI protected a little bit of cracking here in the concrete of course you can ask your clients to or just let them know that they can clean it out with the wire brush Fill it back in with uh, concrete caulking and keep water away from the from deteriorating it more during the springtime. pictures of all the elevations that way if you have to um, you can include them in your report or just so you have something to uh, refer back to in case you in case somebody has a uh, question about drainage or something a uh, year or two down the road Make sure that this little lock is on the uh, power meter here that's put in there by the utility company and if there's ever a question as to why that's not on there then the uh, people selling the home can get that sorted out so your client uh, doesn't have to worry about that with the utility company. Let your clients know that if they the more veg or the, the drier the building materials are, the better. And so if they keep the vegetation cleaned back about a foot or so, then it's not going to be transferring that moisture onto the home and onto the building components, make it last a little bit longer. And like these sorts of dead ones here, if these were laying up against the house during the wind, this is just going to be raking back and forth on this. And so it's not doing anything any good so if you keep it back about a foot or so then uh, it'll keep the building in better condition take a look at these big tall trees this one's probably going to be have to be cut back either this year or next year but take a look for dead limbs those sorts of things up in the trees make sure there's no widow makers or anything like that that's gonna fall and hurt somebody. Like this one, we got a little little branch up there. It's kind of stuck in the in the branches a little bit. I could get pulled down, but just let them know that it's up there. Then at this point you've probably seen the outside maybe once or twice. And so you can uh, go ahead and fill out your report or, or whatever it is that you do at the end of the inspection um, or at the end of the, uh, this portion of the inspection. So right now then we'll move up to the roof. So once you're up on the roof then you can kind of just take a look around from where you're at, get a good visual on what kind of what kind of shingles are up here, what it's made out of. Uh, when you're on the ladder you take a look and make sure how many layers of shingles there are those sorts of things. Don't walk backwards on a roof, that's a recipe for disaster. I 
wouldn't move too far over on two stories because that can be a very bad day if you decide to trip or something like that or something catches your attention or startles you or something. Pay attention while you're up on a roof. You can kind of see where there's some some temporary fixes here. I kind of work in a circle. That way you don't miss anything. In very complicated roofs, it's easy to miss things. So make sure you stay with your game plan. Over here, you can see where they've got the flashing underneath there, but it's not so bad on this roof, but probably because of the overhang, but you'll see on some roofs where uh, this material is kind of eaten up and that's because water's gotten in there. They didn't seal this. And so it gets in there and kind of eats up this, uh, the siding. So when I'll make a comment in my report that the next time that this is uh, re-roofed, that maybe they have like an inch gap here um, and then seal the bottom of those. That way it'll make these, um, make this last a lot longer. You can see the, they've done some maintenance here, different colored shingles on the ridge cap. It's not a bad thing, it's in good shape. They're maintaining, maintaining the roof like they should. B vent over here doesn't, it's got some rust coming down it. They paint these, they last a little while, a lot longer. It's had some hail damage at some point in its life here. No holes or anything, I can't stick my finger through it, it's just normal rust. So just recommend that they paint it once a year. Nice thing about inspecting roofs is you don't want to move anywhere fast on them so you can get good eyes on just about everything several times. So like we were talking about earlier on the exterior you can see where the the uh, pine tree here is needing to be trimmed back. So just make a comment to your client that that'll be an annual maintenance sort of thing. Thing looks pretty good over here. That's not so great. Looks like they need a couple of different shingles there. You can take a look around. These should probably be sealed, all these nails. If they're left unsealed from the top, then they can deteriorate and then uh, start to rust out and then you've got an open hole there into the roof covering. It can lead to some water intrusion. If you're not comfortable working on or uh, walking around roofs, then uh, just do it from a ladder or uh, from the ground, however you feel comfortable doing it, but then also giving your clients a good a good service. Make sure that you're able to complete whatever it is that you're doing. Don't take shortcuts. But this roof, it needs some some general maintenance, those sorts of things. But uh, overall, it doesn't have any holes in it, and shingles look. Uh, for the most part serviceable that does need some repairs obviously but that covers the roofing section now we will make our way to back down to the ladder and then get down all right so now that we're inside very first thing you do is put on your shoe covers make sure that you're not tracking anything inside make sure your shoe covers are clean shows respect for house that's uh, you're inspecting for your client as well as for the sellers uh, the realtors also like it so make sure you show it, put on your shoe covers get that taken care of so the way that I do my uh, inspections once I get into the inside I always think document 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 
And so when I'm doing that, uh, the first thing I do is I let everybody know that uh, sometimes I get here a little bit earlier than, uh, than the realtor or the client or whatever, however I gain access to the home, but make sure that you tell them what your, what your uh, schedule is. So if you're going to do the uh, exterior roof, then move on to the inside of the house, uh, then you do that, but you make sure that you tell them what you're going to do and then that way uh, they have an idea, kind of puts them at ease and lets them know that you have a plan for what you're doing, you're not just doing it haphazardly. So what I do uh, once I get into the first part of the house is, or once I get into the interior of the house, is um, stand at the front door, explain to the clients what we're doing, and I'm going to videotape them, or not them, I'm going to videotape the inside of the house so that I can uh, document where everything is, what all the appliances look like, and then that way I've got a memory of where it is, and if I've got to get a if I've got to recall it back like a year later, uh, somebody gives me a phone call, then I can look at that and have an idea of where everything was. So that's what I'm gonna start doing now. Just pull up my phone, start with the front door. For me, I always move to the right, and that's I'm right-handed, so I always remove to the right. That way I remember where everything is, and make sure I don't miss anything. While you're doing this, you can take a look at the windows real quick. And then that way, you're kind of doing a document of where everything is, but then you're also familiarizing yourself with the home. And just kind of checking everything out. Document where the thermostat is set to where you don't have to, in case you forget, you want to make sure that you set it back to the same temperature and everything that you were uh, when it was got when you got here. Take a look at the fridge. Document whether it's got an ice maker or not. Whether there's ice in the ice maker. Take a look around the kitchen. Notice that there's a missing cabinet door. Take a look under the fridge or into the kitchen sink, rather. Give the plumbing a little pull. Look to see what's in there. You can kind of document and look just a preliminary scan to see if there are any current leaks down there. I always start the dishwasher and washer and dryer if I'm able to, but I don't if there's stuff in there. Clients don't necessarily like it if you, or sellers don't necessarily like it if you break something. And so you just document in your report that you didn't turn it on. Make sure the lights are all on while you're walking around so you can get the most amount of light in here that you can. Not trying to run up the electrical bill, but you are trying to get enough light in here to where you can see everything. And then that way, at the end of the inspection, it's been an hour or two, lighting conditions can change and it can kind of point out something with a different shadow. Crawl space, we'll get that in a little bit. Let's take a look at the fire, or at the gas fireplaces. See if it's got a... See if it's got a igniter on it or not, or like this one's got a key. So I'm willing to bet when I come back here to inspect this that you'd have to light it, which of course we can't do. Keep moving to your same direction that you're moving in. I always turn the fans on too, that way they can get up to speed and you can see if they're actually steady there or if they move around. to see what kind of garage they have. One car, two car, that sort of thing. You're documenting wherever the panel is. So we'll come back to that. But if you don't see a panel, then you'll notice it right off and you'll have to go digging for it.
document what these are. I know from speaking with the uh, realtor beforehand that these are not stain. So set yourself up for success and um, don't cause any necessary issues. So in this particular case, they're not going to stay here, so I don't run them. Take a look at the water lines, the water supply lines, see if they're the black kind, and then what kind of uh, jar vent exhaust you have. As you're walking around, you get to high points. From up here, you can kind of see what the top of the kitchen count or uh, cabinets look like. Take a look at the rest of the walls. See where your attic access is. Kind of look around the room. See what's covered and what's not. Looks like this one's pretty well covered, so there won't be a whole lot that we can check in there as far as outlets go. Same thing with this. If these are accessible, always take a look in the closets just to see where everything was, but then also um, see if there's any, if, see if anything's stacked in such a way that maybe trying to hide something. You're not looking at people's personal items, you're looking past them to look for defects. While you're doing this, you're also testing the doors. Save yourself a little time so you don't have to come back and try to do that again. You can also look down the, look out the windows, look for the roof lines. the sinks make sure that there isn't anything actively leaking and also make sure that there is actually a drain there more than once I've come to a house where there wasn't anything actually underneath the sink and so turn on the water and then it just drains down into the cabinet and then you got a mess to clean up so take a look at it first make sure it's there run the or the bathroom fan while you're here Move the toilets and then also flush them. If you're going to do a sewer scope after, um, sometime during the inspection, it pays to do as many flushes as you can, get enough water moving down. That way it kind of cleans out any clogs, cleans everything up to some extent anyway. Take a look at the inside of the bathrooms, or the showers rather. Make sure that everything is paneled over and covered. And then once you get back over the front door, turn it off and then you can start the inspection. All right, so at this point, uh, I start by doing, I know where the electrical panel is. I'm pretty sure because I didn't see the furnace that it's down in the crawl space. And so we do one of those two things. So I'm going to start out in the garage and do that in the electrical panel. So I grab my bag that I left over prepared for at the front door, and then we move out to the garage. So from our uh, previous walkthrough, we documented where this was. And now we're going to do the inspection on the actual electrical panel. So I didn't see any other distribution panels anywhere, so I'm pretty sure that this is the main one. However, we'll figure that out in just a second. But the first thing uh, that needs to be addressed is that you got to have so much, you got to have a good workspace here. And so the, the homeowner has kind of built stuff around here. 
Uh, there is access to it, however, in a perfect world, which never happens. It would be like so, you know, so tall. So that's for safety reasons. But in this particular case, this is what we're working with. So I would document that in the uh, report. However, it's, uh, it's up to you what kind of um, issue you make out to the client because chances are they're going to leave this stuff where it is. And so it's just more of a nice to know thing for them. Let's see, so I'm looking at what kind of screws they've got here. Take your ticker, make sure that it's got power before you put your hands on it, and then look around at it. More than once I've come across a live uh, one that's been energized, and at that point uh, it's better just to call an electrician because that's what I consider an unsafe condition. So electrician can come out, take a look at that, and then get that inspected. Also like to use these little panel pullers. I've super glued some magnets on there, that way I don't lose screws. But then also it helps me control the panel and try to get it off, as well as keeps me a little bit, gives me a little bit of protection between myself and the panel should something catastrophic happen and you have an accident. A lot of stuff that we do as home inspectors is dangerous. And I consider this pulling the panel off second to walking on a roof. So I'm always thinking about safety. When you're pulling these screws out, take a look at them, make sure that they're designed for dead fronts. A lot of times you'll see like drywall screws, pointy screws, you know, every different, I have, you could see like a uh, deck screw. All those different, or all those screws are dangerous because what you're thinking about is that protrusion going in there too far, hitting electrical wire, and then causing it to arc or causing it to electrify the uh, panel here or lead into a dangerous situation. So. Make sure that they're always like this. If you come across ones that aren't, then I recommend that you uh, put the panel back as best as you can, but don't screw those in and let the realtor know that this is an unsafe condition. You recommend that they use these particular types of screws to put this back on. Um, that way the client, or the seller rather, uh, it has the opportunity to rec or to rectify the situation. And because chances are they don't know that it's not a, a safe situation. So try to keep everybody safe and healthy. It makes the rule go around easier for everybody. Let's see, get this pulled off. Use that as a shield if you need to. And then start taking a look. We know that this house is built in 94. And so you kind of keep that in mind uh, to what, what you would expect to see in the panel here. So we've got a 100 amp service. I don't see any double taps. And I'm just doing a quick overview to begin with. Looking for, uh, make sure that the that there's not missing knockouts, uh, that everything's kind of, it looks to be done in a professional manner. A lot of older homes, they've had quite a few owner, or owners go through them, and so some people can get pretty creative with electricity and lead to an unsafe condition. So be thinking about that as you're moving along. So I take a wooden dowel, um, keep my tape on it so I know what it is. Uh, sometimes kids will ask you what's going on if they're around. And it's fun to say it's just a magic wand. Their eyes light up and then makes everybody have a good day. So I'm just looking for loose wires. 
and I'm looking at each one that way a double tap or some other sort of crazy thing burnt out wire will show up to you because there's a lot going on in panels sometimes. So the last thing I do here is I look for make sure everything seems to be bonded and then where the ground goes to goes down behind this wall so it's probably a U for ground or something. Could be outside. I uh, have to check that. But you're looking for the appropriate gauge of wire. If you haven't gone to Home Depot or you've got an electrical friend or a friend that's in electrical or something like that, or even your own panel at home, go out and take a look and familiarize yourself with what uh, each wire size looks like to make sure that it's appropriate for the breaker that you're looking at. Okay, once you're satisfied with that, Give it another look over. I always take a picture of um, take a picture of it while it's open. Actually, several pictures. But one of the top, or you could even video this too if you really wanted to. But I get along pretty well with pictures. all four sides and then that way if there's ever a question this is what it was at the time of the inspection put your panel back on if you're going to use a screwdriver like that power screwdriver get these inserted by hand first make sure you get the make sure you feel that they've caught a couple of threads before you just go to town with that thing that way you won't strip it and cause an issue for the next guy to open this up. So then the next thing, while we're out here, we're in the garage, we're gonna take a look at the drywall. We'll go back to the door, the man door, here in just a second. But I'm just looking at what the drywall looks like how they maintain their home. You see that they've got gas cans in here. And so you see up here where this has been compromised. And so I tell clients that the whole point of having drywall in the home is not or in the garage is not to necessarily make it look nice, but it's to help protect the interior of the home should a fire start out here. And so if you if you see a uh, dense or compromised unit or compromised drywall here, um, a fire door that you can't determine whether it's been raided or not, then like this, then there's corrections that could be made for safety. Um, that's the whole point in having the drywall and the fire door and everything out here in the garage is to keep a fire from spreading inside the house. So you got to keep that in mind. So then once I get done kind of just doing another look around and I come back over the door, I notice that from before it wasn't self-closing. So sometimes you'll come across um, uh, garage doors that have self-closing hinges and those hinges depend, sometimes they're adjusted, sometimes they're not. But if they are adjusted, then you know that this will close like this. And then that is to keep like I said, if the fire is out here in the garage, it's to keep a fire from spreading inside the house, hopefully. But uh, especially on new builds, if they're there for some reason, uh, most of the time they're not adjusted to where this will shut. And that can be sometimes because um, the workmen are going in and out of that uh, room all the time, or in that door all the time. They've adjusted it where it won't shut on them and then forgot to adjust them back. So. You can tell when you're doing the walkthrough with the client, you can tell them uh, how to adjust them. And then that way uh, it'll keep this door safe. A lot of people don't even know that that's a safety feature. So if it's on the home, then uh, look at it, figure out what's going on with it, and then tell them about it. 
I look to see that that lock works and the condition of it, and then make sure you don't lock yourself inside the garage and then have to do the walk of shame back around the outside of the house. While well, I was looking around, I only saw one GFI in the home or in the garage. It's out here. Works. We've got it kind of in a funny place here behind this uh, counter, but that's the way that they hooked it up. So then, test the garage door. Want to do a look at the garage door. Some of these garage door wheels, or the doors themselves, will have little plastic guides on them. I was at an inspection the other day where on one side it was fine, uh, on the other side all those guides had popped out, and so the door would get uh, jammed uh, every once in a while, and then it wouldn't open and shut. So I'll try to do it a couple times, that way I can see everything's operating correctly. Take a look at the springs. Look at the eyes. If the eyes are, uh, say, taller than six inches, some garage door companies will, you know, they'll have them at all different heights. I always say that I like, if it were my home, I'd put them at six inches because um, I'm thinking about little kids and pets. Little kids, however unlikely, if they're crawling on their bellies, they would not necessarily hit a very high laser. And so I don't want that to happen and I don't want a cat or a, a little dog to get crushed either, so I always recommend the six inch mark. Everything looks good on this. If this garage door did not have uh, these center springs here, but it had like the ones that run up the side, then I would be looking for a safety cable to go down through those um, through those springs on the side. And the theory behind that is that if that breaks, then that cable will keep it attached and it won't come down here and, and destroy some property or possibly hurt somebody. So it kind of keeps it contained. Look for the mounting brackets. Make sure they're attached to the ceilings. Looks like they've got a, they've got some junction things in there for lights and whatever. It's probably not the, that's not the ideal way of doing it. That's kind of a homeowner way of doing it. You could just point, point that out to them that it would be safer in the long run to have an electrician come out and, and permanently wire a, a plug up there. Doesn't look like they've got enough cable or enough wire to actually run it over to there. That's probably why they did that. Um, so just kind of point that kind of stuff out to them. That's, it, it's not the safest of things. I don't even know if those are you all. Yeah, they are underwriter um, certified, but still just bring that up. It's not the end of the world sort of thing, but it's nice for them to know about. So now I'm testing the garage door. I want to see that it opens without too much effort. It's not straining the, the device here. Make sure that it reverses with pressure. for it to get back up, hit it again. Make sure the laser works. Always check it in the middle of the door uh, for the pressure because I have tested it on the sides of the door and it, uh, it gives you a false reading. It doesn't always reverse back. Give this guy pull, release this, very, some of these, like this one, some of these are very, very heavy, 
And so you want to make sure that the spring is doing its job. Get that back and reset. And then you're kind of done with the, uh, with the garage. So mark that down on my um, reporting software, which keeps me on track of everything, make sure I've looked at everything. They're highly customizable, so if you really forget anything, it's really kind of on you because that is your backup system. You can't, if there's realtors in the house, if there's uh, clients walking around asking any questions, there's a lot of things that can distract you from your inspection. So anything that you can do to help yourself uh, remember what to check and make sure you don't miss anything uh, keeps you a better inspector. Make sure you don't have issues going forward and just provides a more valuable service to your clients. You have to think when you're inspecting these homes, this is uh, one of the biggest investments they'll ever make and they're trusting you with that. So it's a very, you have to take it very seriously. Now we'll go back inside the home. We'll go over to the crawl space and check out the furnace. So before we uh, get down into the furnace and the crawl space, uh, I walk over and um, turn the thermostat up uh, 10 degrees. That way I remember what it is. I like to use headlamps whenever I'm in crawl spaces or attics. It's a personal preference, but that also gives me a, it's hands free and then it also gives me a backup. While we're waiting for the furnace to heat up, uh, we can kind of take a look around down here in the crawl space get some pictures and video of where everything is down here. You can see that the walls are insulated, have insulation on them. You know that we don't have insulation underneath the floor in here. You can see that there were inspection restrictions because of the stuff that's in here and where the water shutoff valve is. So you take a picture of the water shutoff valve. There's two of them here, of course, and a lot of clients will ask why they're or two of them, and there's two of them so that the uh, utility company can shut it off or shut off the meter and then uh, replace it, or can shut the, off the water and then replace the meter. If you're telling people where to shut off the water from, I always go towards the most, the, the closest one to the street. So like this one's got two, this one's closer to the door, but this one is closer to the street. And so if something should happen, they know, especially between like here and here, then they know to shut this one off and they're not shutting this one off, wondering what's going on. And so I always point that out. The closest one to the street is the one that you want to point out. While you're down here, you can document what type of uh, plumbing distribution they have. All looks appears to be copper. If you're gonna do a sewer scope, you can look out to where the clean out is. Check the receptacles. Let's take a picture of the furnace as it's here before I ever get to anything. While you're looking at it, just giving everything a once over. It looks like they use a bigger filter here. It looks like they didn't, whenever the tin knockers were in here, they didn't install a door. So it looks like they've just got this put in there. Take a look for the shutoff switch. Test that in a second. Pull off the door. The 
set that aside. There is an absence of a automatic shutoff switch. And so you document that in your report that there isn't one. It's not really a good access to, a, to the fan here, but regardless, there's not an automatic shutoff switch. So you take a picture of it open like this. That way, if anybody ever thinks or ever comments that you didn't check something, you've got documentation that you were in the, in the unit and you did take a look at it. You shut off your lights and you look for the color of the flame in there. It should be a steady state of blue. Take a picture of that without all your lights on so you can document what the color was. Look for the make and model. Take a picture of it. And then once you got that, then when you're doing your report later, you can look to see if it's got the manufacturer date on it. If it doesn't have the manufacturer date on it, then you can look at the serial number, go to the, uh, uh, I don't recall what the name of the website's called, but there's a website that has they can look up the serial numbers of water heaters and furnaces and even some residential building code in there. It's a very, very useful website. So while you're in here, before you put everything back up, let's give everything another glance. This unit doesn't have, or this home doesn't have an AC unit on it, but sometimes when you do, or it's a high efficiency furnace, then sometimes the uh, uh, condensation lines can get clogged and drip somewhere in here. And so you're looking for stains, um, other sorts of ugliness. If you call out, I always recommend that these are serviced, that the, the AC and the furnace are serviced annually. If they're if people keep up to date on them, then they can last a long time. Uh, you never know how long they're actually gonna last, but uh, kind of like performing maintenance on your car, it's an annual expense. And have somebody come out, look at it, certify it, and then uh, hopefully it'll give you a long, a long, long time of trouble for use. This one looked like it was from 94, and so it's been around for, for quite a while. So while I'm down here, I turn off the switch just to see if it actually shuts off the machine or the furnace. Flip it back on. Make sure it comes back on and you don't forget to flip that switch. Otherwise you may be getting a call back with somebody asking you why uh, their house is cold. There's an old water heater down here. So either they didn't want to pay the plumber to take it with them or uh, who knows. But just point that out to a client. Uh, they'll be nice, or they'll, they'll be thankful that you pointed that out. Got another water heater over here, so you're looking for what type it is. You can just tell from the top that it's a electrical heat. If you can find the born on date, then document that, take a picture of it, as well as the tank capacity, so 38 gallons, US Craftmaster. I know that from that, I'll have to go uh, to the website and look at the serial number when I get home to do my report. Another thing that we're looking at on these is just their general condition. You're looking to see what the temperature pressure relief valve looks like. Make sure there's not any corrosion or any leaks or anything like that. We're looking for um, if this is putting water out or something like that, then that's nice to know, which in fact 
it is. And so <clears throat> I always recommend anytime that it's leaking water or something's not happy there, maybe there's not a pressure relief, pressure tank or something in here, uh, which when these were built, I don't think they required that, but uh, it's got that pressure relief uh, tank on it, <clears throat> then that might have some place for that hot water to expand to. In this case, it's leaking out of here. So we know that that's a defect so that you put that in report and recommend that it's be looked at by a licensed plumber. If you're doing a sewer scope, you can take a look over there at the main drain, looking at it, or just preparing for later. You can see that it's got a sump here, but it doesn't have pump and so you're looking down in there you just take a look see what kind of water is down there see how thick it is I can see just from looking at it that it's maybe one inch above the sediment and it doesn't look like that's full so apparently they installed one here uh, thinking that there might be a need for a pump but in this particular instance it doesn't look like they need one Whenever you're in these crawl spaces or in attics or anything, I always recommend that you wear a respirator. And if you're doing a couple of these a day over the length of your career, uh, it can do bad things to your throat. So you can see all the little stuff moving around in here. You're not required to move insulation, but if you can get to it without messing anything up, I like to look at it. So you can take a look at what, what the foundation looks like. You know from looking at the outside of the house that we didn't see anything that would indicate that there might be issues, but you never know. And so if you could just lift this stuff up and take a look. You don't want to pull everything down. You start messing with it too much and it's all going to fall on you and then you're going to spend another hour and a half down here looking. But look over in the corners for where water intrusion might happen. If you see any downspouts outside that are not connected, then it's good to look at the, uh, or then it's possible that there could be some water intrusion down here. So keep that in mind. Also, you can see where they've got the vapor barrier in part of this, but there isn't anything really over here. And so even as dry as we are in Colorado Springs, um, it's better to have this down than not. Say we have a period of really dry weather, but then we have a period of really wet weather, and this could all get water in here. This should be kind of taped up along the side, but fact of the matter is that it's here partially recommend that somebody installs one out here make sure that everything else is taped that way it keeps the moisture down in the ground as opposed to coming up and compromising anything inside so once we've got the crawl space done the furnace done all the structural supports and everything like that that we already looked at then uh, you can move on to the next part of the home, which should just be the regular uh, home inspection, uh, starting at the front door, going system by system. All right, so we're done with the uh, crawl space and furnace inspection. Make sure you come back over and shut, or put this back down. If you do that immediately after you do the uh, furnace inspection, then you won't forget. And then you probably, when you're doing inspections, you generally get hot anyway, but for the comfort of the uh, realtors and any clients that you have inside, get that back to a comfortable temperature. And then also you can, if you have a home that has AC, this one doesn't, but if you have a home that has AC, then you can shut it off. And then if it's nice enough outside, uh, let it sit there for a while and then you can turn the AC on. So now we're gonna start with the, uh, just the regular interior inspection, start at the front door, take a look to see what the weather stripping looks like. These, the door catches 
the, we know from uh, doing the exterior inspection that it's got a front light. And so you're making sure that it's on. You go outside, look at the other lights, make sure that they're all on the same system. Sometimes nowadays they have the lights that are just the, uh, uh, they're night sensitive, so they'll turn on at night. So keep that in mind if you can't figure out why it's not turning on. If the key is in the home, I noticed that this key was here the other day, or earlier in the day. You can take it and turn, make sure everything works. In this particular home, you can see where they've got a deadlock up here as opposed to just a uh, regular handle. I'm guessing they did that uh, to help mitigate the possibility of somebody breaking this window and then reaching in here and turning that. But in a perfect world, which it never is, uh, they would just have a regular handle here instead of requiring this key. Should a uh, uh, emergency happen in the home, uh, who knows where the keys are. It may not be over here by the door, and so that could lead to a safety issue. So point that out to your client. Then also uh, recommend that they change the keys to the home. You never know who has keys. Uh, so if they have the locks changed once they move in, then um, they may feel a little bit better about their safety. So right now, we're looking at lights. Checking the electrical. Open the windows. Looking for other outlets that you can easily get to. I'll be climbing on people's furniture that never ends well. Either you get something dirty, break it, you know, whatever, it's better just to document that there was a, it was covered and then um, bypass it. But if you can't get to them, then get to them. But set yourself up for success as opposed to creating an issue for yourself that you don't need to. So remember that this was... Uh, had a ice maker down here at the bottom. Looks like it's currently making ice. We take a look behind. See if there's any water that we can see. Maybe that water line's leaking or something. I don't see any evidence of that. And you get into the kitchen, take a look at where all the outlets are, and then see where the GFIs are. And that way, rather than going over here, clicking this one, going over there, going over there, uh, you know that there's one GFI to reset, and then you can go that way. So you're making sure that these are all good. sure that they're all wired correctly, not reversed or anything. And on newer homes, if they've replaced a, an outlet and don't know what they're doing necessarily, they can get the wires crossed. So you check that, see that the light works. Open the window. on with the rest of your stuff. Listen to that guy go. And then once you get to the end, then you can see where the GFI, it clicked. And then just make sure that the power went off on the rest of them. You know they're already wired correctly, but you want to make sure that this was actually all made to turn off on this GFI. So then once you walk back over, you take a look at the 
at these. Sometimes, like in this home, you can take a look up at the screws and you see that those are not necessarily the, uh, <clears throat> the cabinet screws. They'll have a little washers on them. And so uh, those will probably hold. It looks like they've been holding for a long time. But you can, if they're, sometimes they're held with like uh, drywall screws and those are not made to hold up cabinets. So you can point that out to your client. If nothing else, then just a, a nice to know. Depending on your rapport with your clients, um, if the husband's looking for something to, some project to do or something that he can do, then you can uh, kind of walk him through replacing those screws uh, with the actual cabinet screws and gives them um, something they can do and start off being a new homeowner that way. The Notice that this isn't, this doesn't have a door, but on our previous, when we were doing our orientation, I noticed that there was a cabinet door over there. And so it looks like they had just removed this and are getting ready to replace this. But you document that to say the door was here, but it was not installed at the time of the inspection. <coughs> so you're not looking at anybody's stuff. You just open these up, make sure that they open and operate. Before, when you go to check the oven, make sure that there's nothing inside of it. Make sure that there's nothing on the back that you're gonna disturb. This one's in here pretty tight, so it's not gonna budge for us, but you tilt this up, or you can look back behind here and see if it's got the anti-tip over device on it. If it's not there, then you can uh, point that out. You go to check the microwave. Uh, Internachi has these little microwave uh, testers. They're very handy. And then if a client's following you around, they often ask you what that is. And then you just tell them that it's testing the microwave, make sure that it's actually doing its microwavey stuff. They get a kick out of it. Uh, high low for the vent check that looking for how high this is sometimes you'll see on remodeled ones where it's really really low it's maybe 12 inches that I would say is uh, too low I don't recall exactly what the measurement is but you can kind of get a feel for okay is this reasonable is this acceptable um, or should I call this out so Keep those kinds of things in mind. A lot of stuff we do is a judgment call, and so make sure that you're paying attention to what you're doing and what you're saying also. Let's see. So I knew that when we did our previous walkthrough or video, I noted that the bottom of the uh, and sink the disposer is uh, wired correctly. It's got the little anti-strain device on it. I took a look at to see if it's got a high loop on it. In this case, it doesn't have one because it's got this stand vent here. And so it's, it's got a, a break there, uh, air gap to where uh, should that siphon back into here, it won't. I've looked at the pipes underneath here. I didn't see any uh, drips or anything like that. And so now I test the sink. If I can, I test it from the disposer side. And then that way I know that all that water has got to run down the disposer across down over to the, um, uh, the P trap and then out. And so if I can only do it on one side, that's what I do. Get that installed. Start off with the hot water first. Get it up and running. Pull the cleaner out. The dish spare. Make sure it works. Wait for this to fill up. A 
when you're down doing the, uh, we didn't catch it on the first part, but when you're in the, at the water heater, you can take a look and see what the temperature is set at, and whether it's like A, C, B, or D. Sometimes they have the actual degrees on them. Uh, but I always, regardless, I always recommend that somebody sets it up at 120 degrees uh, as a safety precaution, just so if they've got uh, kids or something like that, that they don't get scalded. That's getting warm. If you get it up to about half full, then um, it'll have a big volume of water. That way it'll probably cause a leak if there's one to be found. Take a look at the exterior of the sink here. If this was like a granite countertop or something like that and they had a, um, uh, an attached sink but it was attached from the bottom, then you'd look for the clips along the side. Uh, sometimes, especially on flips, they'll have them just kind of jimmy rigged up there with uh, wood. And so you always recommend that they have the actual clips in there so it's not likely to fall, um, fall apart later. So it's kind of inconvenient at some points to wear gloves, but the reason why I wear them is because it never seemed to fail. I was always getting cut on something, whether it be a carpet staple or you know my ladder would catch me or whatever so I started wearing uh, gloves just to protect my hands so I wouldn't bleed all over people's houses. So we look for drains down here or not drains we look for leaks again. Didn't see anything. Turn that back on. Flip this. Listen for it. You do enough of them, you can kind of hear whether the uh, whether there's actually something stuck in there or rattling around or uh, whatever. I've seen pacifiers. I've seen uh, in brand new builds. You'll see uh, uh, construction debris. You never know what you're going to find in a in a garbage disposal. But if you do find something in there, uh, use your best judgment on whether you can fish that out of there or not. See, this guy, we're not going to run this because it's got personal items in it, but we can still inspect it. When you first open up the door, you can give it a little jiggle to see if it's actually mounted. Sometimes when they're installing counter or granite countertops, uh, they won't mount it correctly, so it'll do a little dance for you. But you look for the seal. Look under that to see if that works. And then move on to the next thing. So you keep moving to your right and then make sure that you're not missing anything. A couple of old school phone cables, phone jacks rather. Now let's So at this point, we've probably looked at these windows at least three times. And a lot of times, a fogged window won't show up unless the light changes on it. And so you give yourself enough times to where you can see the, the windows a couple different times. And then that way, any fogging or anything like that will show up to you. And it'll be kind of plain as day. And you'll catch it. See a little vertical crack here. We know that this is a little, uh, this juts out from the home and so there's a main beam that goes up through here. Doesn't look like they've painted this recently or anything like that so I'm not too worried about that. That's just part of, part of where the drywall is. A couple of times we walked through, or as I was walking through, you move these around and just kind of shake them, see what kind of shape they're in. Uh, my hand's about four inches wide, and so I know that if I stick my hand in there and then this is too, um, there's too much, or I can stick my hand through the uh, spindles, then that's too wide uh, for our standards of practice. And so you always mark that out. 
<coughs> to tell the client that when this home was built, or you can tell the client that when this home was built, that wasn't necessarily the code in this area, but uh, you tell them that and explain that it's to make sure that uh, kids and even adults don't get stuck in there. Has happened. We've got a floor outlet over here. I don't like, this one's metal, but you can kind of see where these chairs have been drug across it. Could have, or be best practice to have a, uh, one of the metal copper ones here that have the uh, covers on them. And then uh, that keeps these, it'll be flushed down with this. That way these can slide over the top of it, keep debris, keep, keep debris and those sorts of things from uh, getting stuck down in there. It is a floor. Um, outlet. We are in the kitchen here, so let's see if it's DFI protected. Sweet. It is. So at least they've got that going for it. We don't have to call that out. Make sure you reset that. That way, um, reset any GFIs that you come across. That way you don't get a call back uh, with somebody asking you why they're um, coffee maker's not running. So you go downstairs. This has got a little bit of a, this has got a little bit of a uh, creak to it. Could have somebody fix that. Um, there's multiple fixes for it, but probably what I would do is look to see what kind of access there is at the bottom of that, and then maybe put a leg bolt up there. Or maybe there's a leg bolt already underneath there. Uh, that just needs tightened up. But you don't necessarily have to tell your clients how to fix anything, but uh, if you can give them uh, a couple ideas about how things work, then it makes them feel much more comfortable in the home. Everything's fixable, and you have to remind them that, especially if they're new homeowners. Uh, they get nervous about a lot of things, but everything's reasonably fixable. Exterior door, same thing with the key down here. Might be some daylight up at the top of there, it looks like. Other than that, it's in pretty good shape. Remember from the exterior inspection, there was a uh, floodlight up back here, uh, sensor operated floodlight. It's blocked here. Think about things before you move them. You don't want to break anybody's stuff or cause anybody undue, undue issues. So just be thinking about stuff as you're moving forward. It's got a little stop at the top. A little stiff, but it still opens. Put the little lock things back where you found them. That's where the seller felt most comfortable with them. So just put them back where you found it. So over here on the fireplace, take a picture of the fireplace so you know what kind it was. This is obviously not a wood burning fireplace, but you're looking at the ignition system. You're giving it a good smell to make sure you can tell if it's leaking anywhere or what's going on. I don't see a pilot light or any other source of ignition. So I'm guessing that you would have to light it with a, a match or something like that, which we don't do. Um, I'd recommend that you probably don't do that. Either have the uh, seller demonstrate it uh, to the client, have a plumber come out or whatever, but 
I'd, I would not recommend that you take that upon yourself to go ahead and light it. But we do have to check, and this one does not, you do have to open up the vent and see if it is, like you can see that this one's closed, but when, when you've got these types of uh, vented uh, gas, that, that needs to be open and pinned open or clamped or something to that effect uh, to where you can't hit, just have this in here burning without uh, some place for that gas to go, or the exhaust to go. Like on a regular, on a regular uh, fireplace, of course, it would fill up with smoke and you'd know that it's not breathing. On this, you wouldn't necessarily have that warning. There we go. So now it opens up, but it is not locked. And so document that in your, document that in your report as need of service. Some people might pressure you into checking that. I don't recommend that you do that. Just tell them that you're not comfortable or you're not you're not going to do that and then recommend alternatives to where it can be checked before they move into the home. Make sure that everything's working, of course. You can also, it's also a pretty good idea, same thing with the furnace, is to make sure that those are uh, serviced once a year, uh, depending on how they, how they burn, but at least have them serviced when they first get into the home. <clears throat> and then that way uh, the the logs are situated correctly, the burn is good, everything's working the way that it's supposed to be, just as a safety precaution, <coughs> excuse me, if nothing else. Close everything up. We noticed that that fan was working just fine. So, as we've been walking around, I've been notating where the, uh, what kind of alarms we have. So this one's just a smoke alarm, but I did notice over here, we've got a carbon monoxide detector. So we want to make sure that we have one of these on each level. This is kind of a uh, bi-level or tri-level. So one right here works for me. This one, they were nice enough to have the born on date on it or replaced by date in this case. So. 2029, so we know that they're good for 10 years. Give it a little test, and that's good to go. This one, fire those up, make sure that they're good. Try to keep in mind uh, that people are sometimes talking on the phone, something like that, so give everybody a heads up um, that they're you're going to test those. If you get here early enough in the inspection, nobody's here, that's a good time to test them as well. Let's see, so we know that these are not stained, so we're not going to test them. If they were stained, we would look to see if they've got clothes in them. If they don't have any clothes in them, then go ahead and fire them up and run them uh, through their regular cycles. But in this case, we're not going to test them. But we can check the outlet. And like I talked about, we check the pipes uh, or the supply lines. And then uh, I always recommend that when you're doing the final walkthrough with the client, uh, if there are those rubber pipes, then you can recommend that they upgrade them uh, to a, a different model uh, so that they have a, uh, they're not as likely to uh, burst. And then also recommend that they have the uh, dryer vent cleaned out for two, two things. One for efficiency, because like on, on new builds, if you go back and do a warranty inspection or something like that, um, sometimes if they're up on the roof, the guys that installed it uh, didn't take off the screen and so it's full of lint. And then you'd ask the client how many times they have to run their dryer and they said at least twice. And so you show them the lint and then they know the, why that is. So have a professional come out and clean that um, annually 
and then that helps uh, prevent fires, but then also prevents uh, or it helps with efficiency of the dryer. Sometimes these doors are not adjusted correctly. This one is, but the adjustment for them, if you can't get it to shut correctly for whatever reason, um, the adjustment's pretty easy. You just pick them up and kind of move the bottom this way or that, and then get it to where you can make sure it shuts. It's not our jobs to fix anything, but something as simple as that, just go ahead and take care of it. And then that way you don't have to write it up on the report. It makes everybody's life a little easier. Looking at the steps, seeing how everything operates with those, make sure that they're, uh, they look at least reasonable, there are any trip hazards or anything like that. I was talking about the smoke alarms. Notice that that guy up there is an older model. They're only good for 10 years, and so that one definitely needs to be changed. The other ones look a little bit newer, but that one uh, is probably the original, and so it needs to be changed. So we move up the stairs and take another look around and see that there's a small crack over here and where that is on the rest of this home. It's just a drywall crack. We know that there's a beam going across here. We know that there's a lot of structure going straight up here and that way, but it doesn't look like they've painted it here recently. I wouldn't be too worried about that. It looks like just a drywall crack, which are going to happen. In this particular area uh, of town, there's a lot of movement. Uh, so you can kind of take that into consideration in the area that you're inspecting, what, what would be reasonable for amount of movement and what would actually be a concern. If it's too big a concern or you're unsure, then always refer it to a professional, of course. Turn the fan on. Open these guys up. Let's take a look around, see what's going on. Look for outlets that you can safely check. Guys up to speed. Get that shut off and turn it off. I was looking to see, looks like they've got one light bulb in here, but the other one's missing, but it does seem to have power. So then I don't worry about it because there's just not a light bulb in there. See if the door has a lock and then close it. Look to see if it's grabbing anywhere. In this particular home, they've had tape over a couple of the switches. And so, like this. And so a lot of times that'll tell me that it's either that switch isn't connected to anything or Maybe it's pre-wired for a ceiling fan or 
you know, who knows? But if you can't figure out the purpose for it, uh, maybe the seller knows. And so you put that in there that you say, I couldn't find out what this is for. I recommend that you ask the seller. And a lot of times the seller would say, oh, it's got to be some combination of these switches or whatever. And then that way you've got it documented that you actually looked at it. Making sure that these are not binding anywhere. You can see up here that at some point in time this was binding. They fixed it with a couple of nails. And so it's possible with these wooden doors and wooden frames that during different times of the year, depending on the humidity level, that these can catch. And so when you're doing your final walkthrough with your client, you can kind of point that out to them, saying that it might catch during the spring. But then also, if you know how to fix them, then you can tell them how to fix it. Looks like in this home, they've got one of these adapters here. I always call, or I always think of uh, a Christmas story when I see these, when the dad plugs it in and the, all the lights go out. It's not the safest of things to do. You see them a lot in homes. Just educate your client, let them know that it's not the safest thing to do. Recommend that you only put one, one plug in each um, outlet. Take the covers off sometimes just to see what's what's down there, how dirty they are on new builds. <clears throat> they they hardly ever clean those out. So you just recommend or discuss it with your client that there's likely a lot of dust, a lot of uh, debris down in there, so then they can have them professionally cleaned, and then that way they're kind of starting off with a, a fresh home. During our video walkthrough, I noticed that the, uh, in here, this tub is a jet powered tub. And so we need to get it fired up. And so I'll start it because it's gonna run a little bit of water. That's probably the GFI for it. We'll test that out. Sometimes they can put these in really weird areas. I've seen them in entirely different parts of the room before, but before, or make sure that you know where it is uh, before you leave the inspection. So you can document it. That way, if it's ever an issue in the future, then you know where it is and you can have that answer for your client. So I know the only GFI in the whole home that I've seen, well, I guess I've seen two, that one, and then the one down in the garage. I'm willing to bet that this one and the one in the other bathroom all operate off that same GFI. And so before I pop it uh, or test it, I'm going to test the other one first. And then I don't have to make uh, room, uh, uh, travel up and down the stairs and run around wasting a bunch of time. So get these turned on, get them filling up. Like I talked about before, you're testing these, make sure that there is actually something underneath. And then also when you're, uh, if you're gonna test the overflow, which I do on regular sinks, uh, reach up underneath here, feel what kind of overflow that is. If it's built into the sink, then uh, won't have any issues. If it's a pipe that runs back and forth, uh, then you have to make sure that that pipe is actually secured to the sink Otherwise, uh, you're going to fill this up and it's going to dump a bunch of water down into the uh, cabinet and you're going to have an issue. Make 
make sure that these are always turn the left whenever I start to fill a sink I always turn the left on uh, so that uh, left is on the or hot is on the left cold is on the right sometimes that's not always the case if the even on brand new builds that's not always the case but uh, instead of having a client on a Saturday morning or something asking you what's up with it then you can just let them know from the get-go that in this particular sink the hot was on the right instead of on the left and then they can tell them how to fix it or tell them how to have a uh, plumber come and fix it for them. Get enough water in there to where it's going to cover up the overflows. Don't leave it, if you're going to put, if you're going to fill anything up with water, don't leave the room that you're going to do it in because inevitably something's going to go wrong and you're going to have a, a leak to clean up. So just don't leave the room while you're, while you've got water running. Pay attention to these, make sure how much water they've got left to fill up. Take a look at that, make sure you know where the water situation is before you move on to checking something else. While we're in here, I can check to see what the condition of the grout and the caulking is, see if anything needs changed. Looks like that's just cracked a little, or not cracked, it looks like it's just dirty a little bit, which happens. But it's not, looks can be deceiving. If you don't take a good look at it, if you don't get, you know, right up on it, then you may call out a, uh, an issue when there isn't really one. In this particular case, it sure looks like that's cracked, but it's not, it's just dirty. So I'm talking about that line. There. Okay, I see that these are draining. Pop both of those, open these up, watch them drain. Run your fingers underneath. Look to see if it's draining from anywhere. All the water's out, I don't see any leaks. These are in good shape. Make sure you know where the water or where the spare head's facing, where you don't get a face full of water. Take a look at that. Look for leaks along here. Look for leaks anywhere else. Look to see how the diverter's working. See if this is a substantial water coming out of here when this is on. See whether that diverter is doing its good job. Listen for a whine. If, the, if you hear a whine going on with it, then sometimes that's the diverter inside of here and it just needs to be changed out. Shut that off. Take a look to see if everything's sealed. This one could use some little touch up on the, on the sealant here. Then that way should any water get back behind in there, then it doesn't cause an issue with moisture intrusion. Wait for that to fill up a little bit more. You want to make sure that it's above all the jets. If you don't have it, or if it's not above all the jets, it's going to spray outside. You're going to get wet. It's going to get the cellar's base or bathroom wet. Nobody's going to be happy. Test that one more time. We tested it earlier. Hit it again just to make sure that it is, an act, act, it is operating at full speed. Recommend that those get cleaned uh, annually because all the uh, toilet paper lint and that kind of stuff can get up there and could theoretically lead to a, a fire condition. So if you want to point that out, just a little maintenance tip. If they're accessible, I pull off the trash lid, or not the trash lid, the toilet lid, and take a look and see where the see where the water is actually holding. If it's just below that, it should be about an inch below that one. So this one actually needs a little bit of uh, uh, adjustment. We're always concerned about water usage, and so you want to make sure that these are adjusted correctly. Make sure they're not wasting any water. You can point that out to the client. They'll thank you for it. 
put that guy back on. If you know how to adjust those sorts of things, go ahead and do it. Help the client out. If you can show the client how to do it, that's even better. Um, but if you don't know how to do it, then recommend further by a professional. Don't spend time just idling. You can always keep looking around. You'll always see something new. Like this guy's little drywall crack here, no big deal. I'm testing out light switch. You can fill out your report, anything that you haven't thought about yet. And just keep moving around, keep looking at things. Inevitably, when you fire these up, because not, it doesn't seem like very many people use them, you get some black little flakes and that kind of thing in there. Uh, as part of the report, I recommend, or I take a picture of this, um, show them that it was running, show them where the GFI is, and then recommend that they have it cleaned out before the first use, of course. Okay, we're underwater. Leave that guy running. Hit the switch. Get wet. Like I said. <laughs> Actually, I kind of knew that was going to happen. I just thought it'd be funny. So if it happens to you, you can laugh. <laughs> As home inspectors, our job is very stressful, but the more fun that you can have with it, the more fun that you put your clients at ease, uh, your realtors at ease, then the more successful you'd be with this business. If you're very straight and rigid and don't like to have fun, don't like to you know enjoy your work that shows and you won't be as successful. So just try to remember what you're doing this for, what your why is, and then you can have fun with stuff like this. So we're making sure what's going on, everything seems to be working fine. See the little black things running around in there. the doors, check for locks. Sometimes on homes you'll find that the dock locks are actually on the outside, the, the buttons are actually on the outside. And so um, make sure you point that out to the client that way that if they have little kids or something like that, then they know to change that, change those around before the kid locks themselves in and then they run into an issue. They'll thank you for it. So in here, get that guy started. This guy does not, this tub does not have a jet. So we're just merely testing the hot water. Hot on the left, cold on the right. Pull that up. Hear that whine? And so that, that's that, uh, as the water passes that uh, washer, then it makes that whine. It's a, a component of the inside of that uh, faucet. Sometimes you can get packing nuts to fix those things. Uh, sometimes you have to replace the whole faucet itself. But it is fixable. So we test everything for like slow drains. Get that filled up a little bit more. If something's slowly draining or slowly filling, then I point that out because it could be a, uh, it could just need some Drano, it could be a bigger problem, but you're listening for like gurgles, uh, very slow leaks, um, anything that may hinder the enjoyment of the uh, buyer. When you're doing these inspections, think about, think about how you're doing the inspection. Think about how, uh, if you were living here and uh, somebody pointed out to you, hey, this is an issue, then what would you do about it? So keep those things in mind. Make sure that your client is happy with their home. Make sure they're happy with you. Flush the toilet again. Turn the fan on.
Check to make sure everything's sealed just like in the other one. Keep an eye on everything. That one's draining over now. Sure there's nothing leaking in there. Let's see how it drained. That one's draining. I don't hear any gurgles where it's starving for air or anything. It's probably draining with the other side too, that other um, tub, so it may drain just a little bit slower, but that's reasonable. Look for anything else. Go down the stairs, pay attention to how you walk down the stairs. Make sure that there aren't any, uh, make sure it's, it's natural as you walk down. Sometimes you'll pick up a, you know, if one's like an inch off or two inches off or something like that, you'll, you'll notice that. And then once you get back over to where you started at, then think to yourself, okay, is there anything else that I didn't check? If there is any room that I wasn't in, did I get sidetracked by something? And then go back through your uh, checklist on your inspection software. Make sure that you've covered all the major points that um, all the items that need to be identified per the standards of practice. Make sure that you've uh, taken any major considerations into uh, into your mind, any major defects that you've seen, and then uh, just prepare yourself to do the walkthrough with your uh, your client. Make sure everything that you do with the you do with the client and with the realtor is smile on your face. Makes uh, makes everything a lot easier for everybody. So, okay. All right. So we're going to get ready to uh, climb up into the attic here. I've got my uh, extendable ladder. That's uh, pretty easy. These 17 foot ones are pretty easy to get set up like this, um, especially for attics like this. So they're a good investment. Make sure that you've got a way to clean up the the insulation from up there. Generally, it's some's either going to fall on you or uh, when you're putting it back in there or something's going to happen, there's going to be some on the ground. Um, so just have something to be able to clean that up. Make sure you go in. When you're going to do this, make sure you do it with clean hands. That way you're not leaving uh, hand marks on the uh, paint, which is always flat. It's always flat and it always shows up uh, with the hand marks. So keep that in mind as you're working. If this wasn't an instructional video, I'd wear a face mask. Because um, as when we were in the crawl space, you get all the dust particles in, in your throat and you heard me coughing. And that was because of the dust downstairs. So you get this up. Turn on your lamp. See where you can kind of push it off over to the side and lay it down. Take a look around you. Make sure you're not going to hit your head on something like a, a board that comes across here where it's got nails or some other dummy trap that you might run into. First thing I do when I get up here is turn on the video to document what kind of roof structure it is. I'm looking for where the bathroom vents exhaust to. I'm looking for furnace exhaust or vents. I'm looking for the type of insulation, anything going on crazy with the, with the uh, rafters or in, the trusses or anything built up here. Once I get that done, I measure how much insulation is up here. We're at probably an average of 16 plus inches of blown fiberglass. So either mark that down now or mark it later. Then I take pictures, still pictures, to put in in the report because this is one of those places where the homeowner probably won't go. And so it's nice to, so they have some familiarity with where everything that's going on. Take a look at the, uh, where the bathroom vents blow out. And they're on newer builds, they'll have them running up and outside, of course. But when these homes were built, uh, they just ran them here directly to the attic. 
and so you're kind of looking around for uh, mold and those sorts of issues looking for ventilation up here making sure that there is ventilation of some sort looking for baffles this one does not have baffles where the where the uh, the soffit vents would be but it doesn't appear to be an issue and then I turn my light off and I look for sunlight up here any places where sunlight shouldn't be coming from it should be coming from the vents obviously through the ceiling or through the roof but if there's anything anywhere else then you have to kind of investigate it figure out where it's coming from because sometimes especially if you're only inspecting from the the access which most of the time I do uh, because there's pretty much everything I can see as long as I can get my light everywhere then I'm satisfied with it and then that way it protects uh, everybody from me putting a, a foot through their roof but or through their ceiling but then it also uh, makes sure that I can get a good thorough inspection from everything up here if I can't see everything in from where I'm at then I'll make the determination at that point whether I want to go further uh, and look around but in this particular one everything looks fine you know from the exterior inspection there are uh, soffit vents and it looks like there are there aren't baffles over here and so I might call that out but there is good plenty of insulation here it is level an average of 16 inches if it's not level uh, then or it's bunched up in places say they've been working up in here then you can recommend that it be raked uh, level and then that way it'll be more thorough or uh, more efficient uh, when they comes to heating so they're not just conditioning their attic with hot or cold air then I always wipe my hands off of my pants so Neville they're a little dirty Take your time in the attic. Nobody likes to be up there because it's hot, especially during the summertime. But it can hide a lot of defects if you're not thorough with it. And then, and then you're not doing a very good inspection for your clients. But also keep your safety in mind. If you are walking around up there, Make sure you know where the hatch is and make set a timer on your watch if you need to uh, for you not to be up there more than like five, ten minutes, especially during this summertime. Keep yourself safe. So then after I get done doing that, then I take all my stuff down. And then uh, this is one of the last things I do because generally it's at the dirtiest and I take all my stuff down, put it back in my truck, get myself cleaned up, and then uh, get ready to do the um, walkthrough with the client. All right, so we're at the end of the inspection. Uh, a few things that uh, I would note to the client are the, the roof, uh, servicing the HVAC system, and then making sure that the uh, fireplace works uh, at the final walkthrough. Um, this is Jake at Mountain View Home Inspections in Colorado Springs. Until next time, have a good day.